Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 131. This episode is with the fantastically hilarious Emily Swallow, who is such a good hang. Like, I was looking forward to it beforehand because I knew she was going to be great, but she even exceeded those high expectations. Uh, We talk about how she actually grew up in Florida, which I didn't know, before moving and going to school for Middle Eastern studies, before a teacher was like, hmm, maybe you should try out this acting thing. And good thing she did. Uh, We talk about how she moved to New York to study acting. We talk about her band Jack N. Swallow, which is really funny. Definitely check them out if you haven't already. Uh, And then we talk about how she uh, got over stage fright and studying Shakespeare and how important that was in developing her tools and her actor's toolbox. And then, of course, we talked about her jumping from stage to screen and has had an incredible career ever since. Uh, It's pretty much a safe bet now to where if you see Emily Swallow's name in the credits, you should probably check it out because it's probably amazing. Uh, We talk about how she worked on an episode of Flight of the Concords. Yep, you heard me right. We talk about her run on Monday mornings with Alfred Molina. She has great stories about that. We talk about The Mentalist. We talk about playing God's sister in Supernatural. So she basically got to have superpowers. And then eventually going into voiceover work with Castlevania. And then going from there to, of course, The Mandalorian, where she played the armorer. We talk about what that costume was like, how that audition was. And most recently, she uh, played Emily in The Last of Us 2, which is pretty awesome. She mentioned what that was like doing the motion capture and kind of doing the different uh, mediums when it comes to acting and a ton of other stuff. She's just the best. The best. And you're going to learn that for yourself. Let's just jump right into it. Please enjoy the interesting podcast episode number 131 with Emily Swallow. Theme song time. nice to talk to someone who's in the same time zone as me. I enjoy that a lot. Oh, where are you? I'm in Florida. Where are you? You're in Florida. Uh, I'm in Florida as well. No way. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) Well, wave. Maybe I can see you. Uh, I'm in Naples. Oh, where I'm basically in a different state because I'm in, I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida. Oh. um, And I always have to tell people that North Florida and South Florida are like different countries from each other. (laughs) A hundred percent. People don't realize that it's you actually yeah. get cold sometimes. <laughs> we do, yeah. Yeah, I don't. Just it's enough humid. to like. It's, it's kind of like the uh, the L.A. cold here. Like it gets just cold enough that you can put on some fashionable layers, but you don't ever really have to worry about it. Yeah, yeah. It, I feel like the last time I wore a hoodie was years ago, and I kind of miss it because I have like cool jackets and stuff. And I don't know why. <laughs> I'm never going to wear them, ever. It's crazy. I mean, maybe someday you'll travel again. Yeah, that's true. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. You grew yeah. up You grew up in Jacksonville? I didn't know that. I did, yeah. Well, that's cool. What was that like? <clears throat> well, um, I mean, Jacksonville is a very pleasant place to grow up. <laughs> uh, I mean, it was nice. My, my whole family is still here, so I get back fairly often and uh my husband and I fled New York back in May thinking we were gonna just be gone for a few weeks but we haven't been back so yeah we're enjoying time with our families and we've driven across the country twice and trying to make the most of being unemployed yeah yeah you you switched sides of the same coin you went from New York which was the epicenter to Florida, which is becoming the mm-hmm. epicenter. It's like, why not? Why not? Well, yeah. <laughs> when we first drove down here, we got stopped at the border. And because we were coming from New York, we were told we needed to quarantine for two weeks. And now when we go back to New York, we're going to have to quarantine. <laughs> so you're getting, oh, you're getting the raw my. end of both deals. You come to Florida. They're like, are you oh, from, man. you're not from New York, are you? And you're like, oh, man, I am. So when you go back, you're not from Dang Florida, it. are you? Oh, man. Yeah, you can't win. You can't win. It's a weird. It's nope. gonna be fun to talk about when this is all over. You know what I mean? 
Yeah. yeah. I lived through that. I'm looking that. forward to that time. Yeah, me too. Me too. It's a, that's how I that's how I keep going. I'm like, you know what? <laughs> I one day I'm going to be able to say, "Remember the pandemic? That was crazy, huh?" And they'll be like, "Sure." Remember that silliness? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nuts. Nuts. So you you normally live in New York then? Yeah, basically. I mean, I uh I have gone back and forth between New York and LA for years and I like them both very much and Mm -hmm. haven't really felt the need to claim one over the other. But, uh, when I got married two years ago, Mm -hmm. um, I kind of moved back to New York on a more permanent basis because my husband is in, well, my husband was in a show on Broadway. Right. And so that sort of had to be our base. Um, but now since he's not going to go back to work till like February at the earliest and sure. my work um, at the moment, I know I'm going to be working out in LA next month. So we're like, huh, why are we paying rent on a New York city apartment <laughs> when good point? Where no one's paying us to be there. <laughs> sure. That, hey, that makes total sense. Yeah. Yeah. We're actually going up next month to, uh, or not next month, next week to oh. move out of our apartment and uh, put stuff in storage. Well, why not? Yeah. <laughs> it's a we're we're finding out how adaptable we are as people now. This is that moment yeah. of truth, you know? Mm-hmm. That's not so then if you grew up in Florida, from experience I can say there's not a lot of acting things in Florida. So well, how... not professionally. True. But uh Did your interest start funky... here? Yeah. I didn't know that it was what I wanted to do as a career until sure. I was almost done with college. Um, All right. I always loved it. And I did like community theater and I did plays in school. And, and then I, I went to the university of Virginia and I was, cool. um, I was a middle Eastern studies major. Cause I wanted to go into the foreign service and what? like, That's yeah, cool. <laughs> um, it was very cool. And I'm so glad that I, I'm really glad that that was my major, even though I didn't wind up doing anything with it. I sort of, split my time between my major and doing stuff in the drama department. And um, then by my last year, my major was sort of getting edged out. And like my thesis advisor, who was very supportive of my acting, she was like, just, you know, put a little thought into your thesis and please finish it and (laughs) don't get completely distracted. Um, But by then, I guess, even though I hadn't really consciously made a choice, my, the way I spent my time was deciding it for me. So I, uh, I had an acting teacher who saw how much I loved it and um, asked if I'd considered like going to conservatory or something. And I, I knew enough to know that for certain roles, I could rely on instinct and everything went great. But I'd also had enough experiences where I was like, OK, this character is really far from me and I don't know how to get there. Right. So I knew I needed needed some more tools in the, the toolbox. And so I went to uh, NYU to get my MFA which was awesome because yeah. like getting to know New York while you're in school and it's not just like a complete shock sure. was really great. Yeah, I bet. I bet. So, yeah. Right on. Middle Eastern studies. That's what. So how do you even choose that to begin with? You wanted to do service and stuff like that. That's really cool. Did not know that. Yeah, I knew it. I had been interested in like foreign affairs and international relations. And sure. I, um, that was an interdisciplinary major and it just seemed, it just seemed more interesting because I could choose from like the political science classes that I wanted to take, but I also really enjoyed having a more specific cultural focus and especially with like all the, I mean, obviously it felt relevant to be studying that region of the world. Fair, fair. Um, But just all the history and the, you know, the religions that have come out of there and then obviously like the political tensions and, um, it was it was cool. It was just it was a major that they offered, so I said, "Why not?" Yeah, I also how I live my life. Why not? You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's now. Really tell me cool. how you started doing your podcast. Uh, it, so I grew up. My dad is one of those people that like lived ten lifetimes. Like, bought a boat and sailed uh-huh. the world. Like, w- just lived awesome. everything. So I grew up listening to these kinds of stories. And then five years ago, as of uh, last week, actually, just hit the five-year anniversary, I was like, it'd be cool to hear other interesting people tell cool stories and get to know them. And then here we are. 
Boom. Awesome. Yeah. That's the Damn. super condensed elevator pitch of it. <laughs> uh-huh. But I like it. I, I like talking to people and like, I think that's super interesting. And like peeling back the layers, especially like I've had a bunch of actors on and I love talking to actors as well because you get to know the work if you're lucky, but you don't necessarily get to know the person behind it. And I was like, aha, I have found my niche. Who are you as a person? And then it's just, yeah. fun. just fun. I like it. I like it a lot. Very cool. Yeah. So also, I have to say, now that I'm talking to, you know, Emily Swallow, of course, uh, you know, Taylor Swift is kind of known as like the like the queen of breakup songs. Like she's pretty good at it. Um, yeah. I would like to nominate Now I Have Cake as one of the greatest breakup songs of all times as well. I wow, just, how did you find that? Listen, Emily, my Google Foo is very good. I may have also Man. listened to everything else, and it's hilarious. My God, were you it always is, funny? Isn't it? Were you always funny? Because you're well, I didn't, really I didn't funny. write the song. You sang it. Thank you. But listen, there's writing it, and then there's performing it. Two different skills. And the performance, flawless. Flawless. Well, thank you. I am going to have to reach out to my friend that wrote it and let him know. Cause, Please uh, do. That'll make his day. It's so good. That whole show is really, really funny. Jack oh, man. We had so swallow. much fun doing it. And and I just feel like we, it, you know, we just are meant to be together and to perform together. Jack, however, has two kids um, <laughs> who are very young and is living in New York City and trying to navigate preschool and kindergarten over zoom and all that Ooh, stuff and uh we haven't really found the time and also i've mostly been in la right. up until um You've been a little when busy. i got married so so one day jack and swallow will be resurrected i hope oh thank god there there needs to be this is the hope that will get us through 2020 we found it this is the light <laughs> <laughs> this is all we need to keep going that's right that's right it's genuinely hilarious show I, I really enjoyed well, thank it. Thank you. So, I really so appreciate funny. that. And I th I think it's such a, one, performing is such a specific skill to have because not everyone has it. Some people can sing really, really well, but they don't have that extra little thing. And on top of that, yeah. you guys were really, really funny. And uh, yeah, I just, I had to, I had to say that. It's pretty good, Emily. Thanks. What's, that made my day. Were, so then were you, did you always, were you always good at singing? Did you always know? Or was that something you're like, I'm going to try this. And then boom. No, singing was, was my, my way into performing because my parents um, both love music and my mom sings and my dad plays oh, many cool. different instruments. So there was always just a love and an appreciation of music when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I, my mom sang in the church choir. So like I sang in the, the children's choir and did like, right you know, cantatas and stuff and um, had this. Yeah. I, I loved it, but I also was so shy when I was a kid, and I had tremendous stage fright. Really? But fortunately, my love of it beat out the stage fright. Yeah, it was, I mean, I, I also took piano lessons when I was a kid, and without fail, every recital, I would, like, my leg would start shaking, or, like, something would happen because I was so nervous about performing um, that was totally unexpected and sure. really fun to have to try and deal with. <laughs> but uh, it's it's definitely, I'm so glad that my love of performing was stronger than my fear of performing. So it's not quite so bad anymore. I still, of course, you know, unless we're talking about those dreams where uh, oh, yeah. you are getting ready to go on stage and you realize like you don't even know what show you're in or you didn't learn your lines or all those things that oh, are yeah. just really fun. <laughs> and also I feel like as an actor, it's, I'm like, come on, this is such a stereotypical dream. Like, can I have something that doesn't right. have to do with my profession? <laughs> That's right. Can't I be like assassinated or something easy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That'd be nice compared to this. Jeez. <laughs> That's so funny. And also I think that's important to to say to people that like someone who's found success to be like all right stage fright was a thing because i feel that's such a crazy hurdle to get over uh that a lot of yeah. people do on their journey well, and it's still i feel like most actors i know still get nervous it's uh it's all about like finding the right thing to focus on so that you don't focus on that fear and whether that's 
connecting really strongly with the character or just, you know, thinking more about the other people on stage with you than about yourself. There's so many things that can get you out of it. And I feel like that's what most people have to do. I know very few people that don't get nervous at all when they're performing. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So then when you you said you were able to rely on instincts for a lot of things, but you needed the training to kind of build up yourself as an actor. How was that training? Mm -hmm. How was like conservatory and like training school? Was that crazy? Was it different than you expected? It was. It was. I'm so grateful that I did it when I did, even though like I, I went straight out of undergrad and there were many people in my class who'd been out acting for a few years and then had decided to come to grad school. And they definitely knew more specifically what they wanted out of it. I was just kind of like, all right, here I am. Sure. Let me learn it all. There you go. And, um, but I, I think even though I might not have, I, you know, I felt a little lost, but that wound up being a good thing because I was so, I was such an overachiever. Well, I was about to say I was such an overachiever as a kid. I'm still an overachiever, <laughs> but I had always relied on, you know, the academic way of doing things. And if you study hard enough and you study the right answers, you're going to get good grades. And that doesn't work with acting. And, sure. um, they called me out on it and I'm so glad <laughs> it totally threw me for a loop. And I was so confused, but I needed that disorientation to, to start to put the pieces back together again, because I was, I was trying to get things right. And I was trying to Ooh. figure out what they wanted from me. And, um, and they saw that and they were like, Hey, okay, if you do this, first of all, you're going to be really boring as an actor, like staying within all the lines and trying to be safe. And, right. and they said, um, you're also going to get tired of it cause you're not going to be interested. And, and they said, you got to be willing to fail. And I mean, I just feel like I needed to hear that as a human being because yeah. <laughs> I was so used to trying to like, you know, it was it was easy to feel like I was doing the right thing if I was getting good grades or I was, um, you know, getting awards and stuff. Um, sure. And that's, that's great to an extent, but it's very limiting and it doesn't necessarily mean you love what you're doing. It just means you're checking off certain boxes and um, getting attention for that. So I love kind of having all of that dismantled and, and being very confused for part of the time. And then realizing that that was such a great place to work from, to, to approach things without preconceived notions of what it needed to look like or sound like, and to find new ways into the work. And one of the things I love about NYU as a program is that, um, they really like they kind of throw the kitchen sink at you in terms of approaches to the work. Oh. And so I did like I took a clowning class. I took uh, we took musical theater, even though it's not a musical theater program. But like sure. their philosophy is even actors who are never going to do musical theater can learn something from trying to act a song. And like you were talking about earlier, like plenty of people can sound pretty singing, but like truly getting to that vulnerable place where you are being honest and open while singing is a whole, yeah. whole other level. Oh. And, uh, and I continue to draw from that. I mean, even, you know, when I did um, the Mandalorian and I had to figure out like how to move around in this big suit of armor and a mask, like I was drawing from some of the commedia mask work that I'd done in grad school. And, and so it's exciting, like to get to see how all of that pays off in like totally nonlinear ways. Yeah, it's it's like it just it just shows how important like a strong foundation is. It's like I'm going to teach you the basic thing. These Absolutely. are the tools, and then you use them as you see fit. It, the importance of training yeah. makes sense to me. Totally, I'm seeing the thread here. Yeah. I'm seeing the thread. <laughs> so if you're in theater school, you're definitely doing Shakespeare. Oh yeah. Uh, how uh, Shakespeare is a different language. Was that something that <laughs> so, <laughs> someone who went into acting is like I'm gonna I'm gonna try this out, and then like. Hey, Shakespeare, how was it tackling that? Well, that was definitely an area where I had, I think partly because I have a musical background, mm -hmm. um, I had a certain feel for like the rhythm of it and the language of it. And that was helpful to an extent. But then I also saw where, and we've all seen those actors who like sound beautiful 
with like the the verse line and the rhythm and the shape of it, but you have no idea what they're saying, and you can tell they don't really know what they're saying. Yep, yep. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I definitely had to appreciate like some of the the ways that it came naturally, but then get inside that and get underneath that, and and I I just think that Shakespeare is one of the best things to work on if you want to grow as an actor in any respect. I think even if you're not going to perform Shakespeare, getting into that language and then sort of dismantling it and trying to approach it as if it's a new idea every time and trying to speak the verse as if it is completely spontaneous. Um, There's such great tools. And I actually, during this pandemic, I have been doing this like totally nerdy, awesome Shakespeare workshop over Zoom with a director that I worked with a decade ago right. and it's oh. fantastic. And, and the work that we're doing on the text, I have found to be really helpful, like even for like different voiceover auditions and for some of the TV auditions that I've had, um, because it, it gives you like, you know, there's certain rules for Shakespeare mm-hmm. and as you get more familiar with those and you can sort of forget them, I think it just, the things that it taps into and um, demands of you as an actor, like that's going to help you grow no matter what you wind up performing. True. So that's been really cool. And one of the silver linings, I guess, of of uh, the Zoom world that we're now in. Yeah, for real. It's, it's interesting. I love talking to people about Shakespeare because it's like the other thing. I remember the thing that used to trip me up a lot was the way that it's written. It's not like mm-hmm. sentence punctuation. So you're like this line. These three lines are actually one sentence. That you, is, this is the thought here, and I was like, oh, oh no. So trying to rework yeah. your brain in the sense that like this, he's saying one thing over this yeah. area, and you're like, oh, wow, this is English. I speak this language. I know I do. <laughs> I know I do. I'll figure it out. <laughs> but there's well, so much whole, to get. I, I'm sure you've seen like it's a whole. Like you can understand that intellectually, but then getting that into your body is a whole other challenge yeah. and getting to the place where it feels, it feels natural to breathe the size of breath you need to be able to speak that entire sentence, even though it covers multiple lines. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a whole, whole other thing. Do you have a favorite? Shakespeare? Oh yeah. I asked the hard um, questions here. I wait till you're comfortable. And then I, <laughs> mm, take that. Well, my favorite one that I've ever worked on is The Taming of the Shrew, partly because it surprised me so much. Sure. Um, I mean, talk about a play with strong opinions about it. (laughs) uh, For real. The kinds of things people have done to try to make it work in different ways. And Mm -hmm. and this it was it was um, the director that I'm doing this workshop with right now who directed it. And it just blew my mind what we were able to find with it, because he. He, are you familiar with the play? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So he, when we got into rehearsal, he said, I think that this is a love story. I think that these two people oh. genuinely wind up loving each other. How can we find that? And um, wow. and we didn't do anything to change the text. Sure. But it was remarkable because we, when we had audience talk backs afterwards, people were like, what did you change about it? Because this isn't a love story. And yet you made it a believable love story. So you must have like rewritten something or And we didn't at all. And um, it gave me such a new appreciation for it because I think, you know, Shakespeare's got a lot of amazing characters and amazing stories, but there's, you know, there's these different, uh, these different sort of like magical things he puts in there, like mistaken identities and, um, you know, people falling in love, even though they don't know anything about each other. And then the, the, the play ends with the wedding. And then what happens after that? And I feel like, Taming of the Shrew is a play where the wedding happens fairly early on. And then Mm -hmm. you get to see like, how do these two people who are very strong, independent people, how do they learn to communicate and how do they become partners? And, um, and we, we were able to find that journey through it and it was thrilling. Um, So much fun to perform and so much fun to hear people, how surprised they were by it. So that's definitely one of my favorites. Cool. That's really cool. And it just shows how great Shakespeare is. The fact that you cannot change yeah. any of the dialogue and here are all the colors that you can paint with. You're like, oh, there's totally, more. Yeah. 
That's nuts. So then if you're doing theater and stuff like that and it's going so well, did you always want to jump to screen? I didn't. Um, I was so madly in love with theater. And I was like, eh, you know, maybe, but I don't really feel the need. Sure. Um, and I didn't, like, I, I sort of started doing it just because I was like, well, it's there. I might as well see what it's like. Right. Um, and it's still, like, I feel like I need to be doing TV, film, and theater to, like, feel really satisfied because they Fair. pose such different challenges. So different. Um, yeah. And I, the thing that I always miss when I'm doing TV and film is that you just have so much more collaboration as a company when you're doing theater. True. And I love that. Like, my favorite time is the rehearsal period when everyone's, like, coming into the room with different ideas and you're putting these ideas up with other people's ideas and then you're finding something entirely new. And um, especially in television, you just don't get the chance to do that as much because especially if you're like a guest star on a show, you basically, you have to do all your rehearsing on your own, which right. I have to do. Like I have to, I definitely have to like be on my feet with a friend or with my husband or somebody who can like go through the scene with me and help me decide what my choices are and all that. Sure. Um, but then you get to set and you kind of just have to shoot it. Like you don't really have that much time to, you're lucky right. if you even get a table read. So true. A lot of the collaboration is happening um, very last minute. And that's also a fun challenge because um, I think that, uh, you know, I've worked with a lot of people who, who do their homework and come into work prepared. So you are able to play. And then every once in a while you're like, oh, this person yeah. <laughs> didn't Whoa. really even read the scene before today. Yeah. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Like, how, yeah. can, how can I make this not right. reflect on me? Let's do this. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. I hear you. And also, I mean, on a TV show that, like, if, you know, the experiences I've had where I've been with the same character for a while and recurring on a show. Right. Um, that lends itself to um, a saturation of the character that is also really cool because just by virtue of relaxing and you know you go into a set and no matter how many things you've shot before like every set is slightly different so there's all these different variables that you're trying to see like okay here's how they do this here's how they do this here does it and you have to kind of like get comfortable with all that and then you can finally do the work that you've prepared and so yeah. if you are coming back to a show multiple times and it becomes more familiar then I think that relaxation that allows for the the inspiration to happen comes more easily. And it's, it's cool to like be with a character over a year or more. Um, my experience this season of supernatural coming back to this character that I first did four yeah. seasons ago and revisiting her, like is really cool because I've had all this life in between and she has had some life in between. And so it's cool to like get to revisit that and, and, uh, and work with the same people and see how they've grown. Right, right. I mean, that's every actor's dream is to have a character that has an arc. So you like got the full. Yeah. Name. Oh wow, look at this! Like, there's some meat there. Like the if you can get something that comes back that you get to play with that, that's got to be so fun. Oh, it is. And then I know you got to work on one of the greatest shows ever, uh, Flight of the Concords. Pretty good. <laughs> Pretty good, Emily. Oh Pretty my good. gosh. <laughs> I mean, I've had so many amazing experiences that I look back on and I'm like, wow, I had no idea what I was getting into. Yep. And this was one of them because <laughs> I knew, like, this, this the show had never aired. Right. They hadn't premiered yet. And I sort of knew their musical act. You know, I'd seen some stuff online. Perfect. But here was this script that was just, the style of it was unlike anything I had ever seen. And I'm reading it and I'm like, I think this is really funny, but I don't really even know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'll translate, maybe. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, Brett and Jermaine are just like such great guys and so fun to work with. And uh, and so I was really happy that it, it came out the way that it did. And watching it, I was like, oh, this is delightful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it was definitely it, a cool show to be on. It kind of like I when I when I saw that I was really excited because it kind of you know Jack and Swallow and Fly the Concords mm -hmm. you've got like they could be in the same lineup 
you know, so it was really cool I that know. early on you got to work on Flight of the Concourse. I was like, we have crossover, ladies and gentlemen. We're doing it. We're doing this. Man, what really if we cool. could join forces somehow, have a double bill of Flight of the yeah. Corn? Con- Flight of the Corns. Flight of the Concourse <laughs> and Jack mm, Swallow. That's right. How would we combine their names? Flight of the Flight Swallows? Flight of the Swallows? <gasps> Emily. Oh. We did it. I mean. This is it. That sounds a little more dignified than Jack and that's, Swallow. That's but, true. Uh, that's I true. guess we could do it. Jack of the Concords. No, we'll figure it out. We'll work. There we go. We'll workshop it. That's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll figure something out. Yeah. You you've had a really fun career, little things here and there, and then big things. And like you worked on the Lucky Ones, which I'm a massive Michael Pena fan. So any movie he's in, oh I'm watching yeah. It. And you were fantastic. Even like you're saying, even these Thank you. like you. I've found that you as an actor, you're able to find what would be considered like smaller supporting roles and finding a lot of like nuance and gravitas to them. So bravo on that. Well done. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm a, I'm a big fan, big fan of uh, of the way that you work. Because there's some people as well that like, I don't know, I can't really explain it. But when you watch them on screen, you're like, there's something, there's something here. It's like tangible. And uh, you do it well. You do it well. well Thank done. you. That means a lot. And even f- like going on from there, I know you worked on Monday mornings, which Robodeau uh, is so funny. Man. Like, I think because you're naturally funny, it comes through in your roles. And that was one that just cracked me up. So well done. Thank you. That was like, I got so spoiled doing that show. Yeah, I bet. Um, <laughs> I mean, that that collection of actors was just a dream team. And uh, it was heaven. And, and I'm so... You know, it's the show, of course, that I mentioned and people are like, what? Huh? <laughs> so few people got to see it, but it was so satisfying to do it. And I learned so much because it was, I mean, these these incredible actors who are all from pretty different backgrounds, like getting to getting to know Bill Irwin and yeah. his clowning background and see how like he uses that in his TV work and then getting to watch. Alfred Molina, who, yeah. man, legend, seeing the way that he works and the way that he interacts with other people was just such a gift and really? so, so instructive because he's one of those people who, um, you know, there's a lot of like bad behavior in the industry that's sort of For sure. excused because people are really talented or, you know, it's their process and Right. He's insanely talented, and he's also one of the most gracious and generous actors I've ever worked with. Oh, and so um, cool. and that was such a good lesson for me to see early on. To just not that like I don't I don't think that I would I don't think that I would have the balls to ever be like I'm such a <laughs> badass I'm going to be a jerk to people. Right. <laughs> but just like the little thing of um, you know he it, it's a it was a David E Kelly show so he right. had these tremendous monologues as the chief of staff and seeing the relaxation that he had, even if he was losing his lines and the lack of worry that he had was really cool. And it sort of showed me, because I think sometimes when we recognize we're carrying a big load, a big responsibility as an actor, like we want everyone around us to know that we are taking it very seriously and that we are working very hard. And that if we, you know, if we mess up, we're very sorry. And there's like, this anxiety that can be in it. And he um, did not have that. And it was so instructive to see because it, it put everyone else at ease. So nobody was worried like on the days that he had all this dialogue to get through. Um, And it made him better because he didn't have that moment where, you know, you're going along, you're going along, you're going along. And then sometimes if you go up on your line, you might like all of a sudden everything gets tense and you're like, Oh no, where am I? And he would just breathe through it. And sometimes the line would come and sometimes something different would come and it would be equally inspired. And, um, and it was just so, so cool to see and to see like how, how that is part of why he's such a wonderful actor, I think, because he doesn't have that worry. Um, it was a good lesson for sure. Yeah. It's like you get to see a pro in their element. That's the best school. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yes. That's so cool to hear that Doc Ock is really nice. (laughs) He is. (laughs) I just saw Boogie Nights for the first time, like a month ago. Isn't that crazy? I have to admit, I've never seen it. He's in it. All right. Well, yep. that's reason enough to watch it. Yep. There's, the, there's your homework for the day. It's pretty good. It's pretty All right. good. Philip Seymour I like Hoffman's that homework. Movie. Yeah. I mean, this is the kind of homework I give. 
I'm like, the kind that you forget immediately. Right. <laughs> and then I know from there, speaking of recurring roles and ones that have arcs, you got to work on The Mentalist for a while. Is that? Yeah. That's well, gotta not be that fun... long. It was like a, a season. That's a long time, for, especially for, like, you had long enough to where you're able to sit in it, but I have a big question about yeah. The Mentalist. Because sure. you're, you're there, you're an agent, there's a lot of walking out of elevators. Are those real <laughs> elevators? <laughs> what do you think? I don't think so. I think it's a fake elevator. No. Man. Yeah. How do you get in there? I'm not, I mean, I have had sets where they've been real elevators, but the elevator doesn't move. <laughs> I knew it. Every every time. I never really thought about that. Like all the all the walking in and out of elevators that happen. Right, happens. right. That's why I'm here. This is yeah. my job. This is my job. I watched nine seasons of Castle. New Insight. Yeah. It's like, this, oh, here comes. Okay. Here then come. you, you are well versed in that. I've seen a lot of elevator walking. And I always wonder. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, there's no way. There's no way that's a real elevator that they're waiting for the doors to open. So, I, whoa, hold on. So then are there people opening those doors manually? Um, I'm trying to think about that set. No, I think that they opened on their own. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to get to the bottom of this whole elevator situation. Yeah, I feel like this is a whole like coffee table book that you could do. It is. It about is. About the different elevators on different sets and whether or not they're real and who's exactly. the most convincing elevator walker outer or That's inner. Done. Both of them. There'll be two categories. <laughs> Inners and outers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then we have to figure out what the title would be. Because my last name is Balance. So we'd have to incorporate that somehow. Oh. But maybe there's an elevator yeah. pitch. But um you know, maybe. I don't know. Definitely. We'll workshop it. So we got to combine okay. Jack and Swallow and Fly to the Concords and come up with my elevator pitch for an elevator. And book. elevators. Done. Brilliant. Done. We got this. More homework. We'll figure this out. And you you mentioned Supernatural, which, again, that's one of those performances that you were able to bring a lot to it. You basically got to have superpowers, which is pretty cool. Oh, my gosh. I mean, yeah. dude. But also, how do you audition for God's Sister? Because that sounds oh goodness, like a lot. Right? <laughs> Ridiculous. But it was such a, I mean, it's a testament to the writing that they, because, you know, you get an audition, you get a character, and you're like, okay, how can I relate to this person? How do I not relate to this person? What, sure. You know, what can I draw from? And, of course, I have nothing to draw from in terms of, yeah. like, being <laughs> a super supernatural being or having God as my brother. But they wrote her with such, you know, the, the whole source of her, um, smiting people and being so ticked off all the time was that she was really hurt by her brother and she felt misunderstood and she felt like nobody listened to her. Yep. And um, there's definitely, definitely things I could draw from for that. <laughs> so it was interesting though, because that was the first time I'd ever done a character that had superpowers. And so the first few episodes when we were shooting it and I had to like hold up my arm yeah. And, you know, they said, then we're going to put all these effects in and it's going to look great. I felt like such a doofus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was just standing there like, you know, pointing my finger and just going, oh, please, please, please let this look good. Right. <laughs> and then when I finally got to see one of the episodes, I was like, oh, OK, everything's fine. They know Ooh. what they're doing. I don't look like an idiot. Right. <laughs> um, but, God. yeah, I, it was just I mean, that character. Wow. Yeah. Again, like something going into that audition. I had no idea what a gift that character would be because the the show is just so much. It's so much fun. I mean, it's yeah, it's, that's such a great sense of itself, and it doesn't take itself too seriously. And yet, like the heart of it is so genuine. Like the the bond between Sam and Dean and the importance of family. Like that is genuine and. They get to do like a lot of really silly stuff, and the yeah. combination of the two is just kind of lightning in a bottle. Agreed, agreed. And I think that also shows like the type of guest star roles that they have has to fit into that. It's like such a specific box that only certain pegs will fit into, and to be able to play totally. one of those truthfully as you did was really cool. And Thank like, you. It's such a massive. Sh I mean, what they just they just finished like bow yeah. on the top after what was it like fifteen seasons or something. 15 That's... seasons and they could have kept going for sure for I mean, sure but uh i really respect though that they they didn't it, it and it's such an interesting thing like going into a show that's been running for a while um you never know like what sort of mix of 
emotions and attitudes you're going to get from people. Cause some people get really tired doing like the same character for many, many years, or they get tired of the hours or, you know, all these, right. they might be grateful they have the job, but it might not inspire them anymore. And, and, um, Jared and Jensen are just phenomenal human beings. I mean, they're, they're such wonderful actors, but just as people to be the, you know, the top two people on the call sheet mm-hmm. and to work the hours that they do. And when they're not shooting the show, of course, they're like off at conventions. Like the amount of time they put into the show is huge. Yeah. Um, and yet they are just so present on set and so welcoming to new actors and so playful and collaborative. Um, and I think that that's why the show has done as well as it has. And, and they don't, they do not take for granted the level of fan support that the show has, and they really respect the fans and care about them. So, um, so they didn't take the decision lightly to end it. Um, but, uh, I, I'm glad, and I know that there's fans who are that even if it ran like 25 years, so wouldn't be satisfied. But right. <laughs> I think that the thoughtfulness they put into to uh, deciding to end it. And I think that that was all handled really well. Yeah, I think so too. I think so too. I'm excited to see it. Was there looking back on it then? Cause you got to do so much cool stuff as the darkness. Is there any scenes that you can mm-hmm. remember that like this particular one I thought was really, really cool. Um, definitely at the end of season 11, when I finally got to confront Chuck slash God slash yeah. Rob Benedict. That was so satisfying because yeah. I'd been, you know, trying to find him for so much of the season. When I first started doing it, they they hadn't decided, or at least they hadn't told me, that Chuck was definitely God. So oh. I was like, you know, trying to find my brother God, but I didn't even know who that was. And then when they decided it was Rob Benedict's character, I got so excited because I just think he's hilarious. and yeah. And, um, and I was like, maybe there will be like some just stupid sibling rivalry stuff. And, and that did not happen, uh, <laughs> that season, but we got like this epic Greek confrontation Yeah. and, uh, and it was just so much fun and, and just so satisfying to finally like stand face to face with him. And, and then I got like the ridiculous, silly sibling banter off screen. And like, when we do conventions, like I really do. I feel like he's my brother and I have so much fun with him. Love um, it. So that definitely stands out. And I also just, the, the episode that I got to do where I got to work with Ruth, cause there's, Ooh, yeah. there's very few times on that show when there's just two women talking to each other without any of the guys. And right. so it was fun to, to get to live in her world for a while. And I kind of hoped that the two of them might join forces or, or at least be like, you know, shopping buddies or something, but alas, it was not meant to be. That's right. You can't have it all, Emily. Come on. No. We talked about Dang this. It. You get superpowers. You get awesome scenes. I mean, come on. Come on. So greedy. I know, but you know what? I don't blame you if it's the character. You know, <laughs> this, this is the this is how method you get. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's not my yeah. fault. No, I'm I'm not putting this on you at all. I'm gonna actively take it off. That's over there. All right. And I know after that, you did Castlevania. Now, that's different from anything you've done before. Because we're talking about, like, an anime. You're diving into the VO world now. Like, one, fantastic work. Uh, Loved loved your Lisa Tempe. So how how was that process? How did you get into that? Like, how cool was it? It's got to be cool. Um. Yet again, something where I didn't really know how cool it was until I had already done it because it was just, <laughs> it was just another random voice. I can't tell you how many voiceover auditions I do in a month. I bet. And it's everything from commercials to, um, you know, Disney stuff to these animated series. So um, I found out I had gotten this and I, and I knew that Castlevania was like a video game, but right. that was sort of the extent. And I went into record the first time and and the thing that that is so weird about voiceover and sometimes not as satisfying to me because i love collaborating with people is that sure. you might record your, even if you're doing a scene you might just record all of your stuff on your own right. um, without actually talking to the person and then they put it together later and that was the case with my first session oh. for Pennsylvania. 
but while I was there, they, um, they said, Hey, would you like to see some of the animation to get a feel for like what the tone of the show is? And I said, well, yeah, absolutely. And I was just like, I was speechless because it's so beautiful. It is. Um, yeah. And, and so that was very cool to, to finally, to, to get to make the connection that like, Oh, this is the world that we're creating. And then it was, it was kind of funny because Graham, uh, McTavish and I had worked together on a, a video game, oh, sweet. um, a few years before. So I knew him, but we never actually recorded together until I think there was a, one of the episodes that we did, um, like last year or maybe even earlier this year. I don't remember. Time makes no sense <laughs> yeah. anymore with the like yeah. the year of COVID. True. Um, and we were not in the same room together, but we were recording at the same time and we could hear each other. So we were actually acting together and that was so much fun. Nice. Um, but yeah, voiceover is sort of weird like that. And it's, I, I don't think of it really much differently than other acting because I think for me, at least to find the voice of the character I have to, like, it's got to be in my whole body. Right. Um, so I'm still, like, you know, moving around and doing stuff when I'm recording in the booth and, and kind of do all of the the background work that I would for something where I'm um, live action. Mm-hmm. Um, just because that's I that's the way I like to work, and it's more sure. satisfying to me that way. You commit. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's trippy to to like create this voice, create this character and then see later, like what it looks like. It's a kind of a weird thing, but very cool. And I, I want to do one of, one of my dreams when I was a kid was to be, um, to be a voice in a Disney movie. Yeah. So that's still a goal. And I guess, you know, now that Disney owns star Wars, I guess I've sort of checked that box, but uh, it's coming. It's coming. Eh. I can, I can see it yeah. very easily. I think you might need to set your bar a little higher because you're you're about to run it into this one. <laughs> that's cool, though. From your lips. That's right. That's right. I'll put in a call for you. Uh, that's great. Really Thanks. interesting because a lot of times, like with anime and animation, sometimes they do like lip dubs. Sometimes they do the voice and then the animation afterwards. So it's interesting to hear that it was uh-huh. the other way around. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. And then you got burned at a stake, so that's kind of neat. You can say that now. Oh man, right? <laughs> How cool though that like I I died, but I was like, well, that you know, for uh, blah, 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 blah. at first I was like, you know, I'm dying in the first episode. That's not very promising, but right. <laughs> I get to come back and all these flashbacks, so it's okay. There you go. It, Death you don't got matter. The, the best of both worlds here. Oh. And then, like you said, you you're in Star Wars now. Did you know that? Yeah, it's it's crossed my mind a few yeah. million times. <laughs> That's pretty cool. And you got to play one of the Very coolest cool. characters to ever be on screen. Holy crap, right? Dude, you're a space blacksmith, warrior lady. Oh my gosh. What? And I watch it and I'm like, who is that super cool lady? Like, it doesn't even feel... <laughs> There's such a disconnect. When my husband and I were watching um, the last episode of of the first season and that fight scene came up, I, both of our jaws just dropped. Yeah. So I didn't, you know, I, I know sort of like what's going on when I'm shooting it, but I don't know how everything's going to look. Sure. And, uh, especially with that, like I've never been a part of anything so secretive where like, I didn't even know who else was in it unless I happened to work with them. But right. as like announcements came out and they were revealing like other actors that were in, I was like, Oh my gosh, that's so cool. <laughs> I so, share a page with them. All of it's surprising. Yeah, yeah, I bet. I bet. How was that audition then? There's no way you knew you were auditioning for Star Wars. They're so pinned up. Yeah, I, I knew that it might be. Mm-hmm. I knew that it had something to do with Star Wars, but it was so vague. Like, I didn't really think much about it. Um, and yeah, it was, uh, I knew that this character was a, a Zen leader of a group of people. That was basically it. Sweet. Um and that originally the breakdown went out for a British woman in her 50s or 60s. Ooh. So. You're not either of those It things. was just total. <laughs> no. And it was such. I, I feel like it was just such luck that I got to audition for it. Because, yeah, it wasn't. They weren't putting out a casting call for me. Right. Um, and uh, 
I, I do have to say, though, and so, and so that's why um, she did wind up with sort of a pseudo British dialect, because in the audition, the casting associate said, you know, we've mostly been seeing Brits. Maybe you should do a few takes where you have that. And then ultimately nice. we decided to keep it because John really liked that that sort of set her apart and made her, you know, put her on a different level. Sure. Um, and I have to say it was immensely satisfying both doing, doing Lisa Tepes first. Yeah. Um, because, because there's so many Brits that come in with their like flawless American accents. And, <laughs> I was gonna and say. you know, they, I'm not going to be so territorial as to say like, they take our work. Right. But there's a lot of, um, I think that there's a, uh, sometimes I will get a voiceover audition and it says like, don't even try to do a British dialect unless you are British. Like there's a lot of, Oh, sort yeah. of uppityness yep. about that. So it was tremendously satisfying to get to do yeah. Lisa Pepe's and then to to get to give the armorer that, you know, sort of like British mid Atlantic just heightened speech yeah. flair. Um but it was a very low key audition. There was nobody in the room except for the the, the casting oh. assistant and myself. Yeah. And um and then I never, like, I, I never had to audition for anybody else. Um, and, uh, man, it, it was just, it was sort of a crazy thing to um, process because, also because it was this new, you know, Disney Plus was a new platform and, and all of the, the ways that they're trying to, like, figure out how to work out contracts for these streaming platforms. It's just, sure. so much of it is, is so garbled. And so, um, you know, they were they were like, well, we're not even really sure like what kinds of like what the, the salary is for like the regular old people who were getting involved because they were basically, there were very few roles that they were auditioning because they were like going to all these big names and just saying like, Hey, do you want to be in this? Right. Um, and so, you know, I was one of the kind of just like regular old people who was in it and they were trying to work all that out. And, and, um, and then I knew, I knew I was in, two maybe three episodes but um like i had to log into this secret portal to to read my scripts and and uh i felt like i was probably being followed by like a, a lucas films <laughs> drone at all times you can't confirm 100 um, that's what happened <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but they're able to paint so it, it out was, it was very trippy what'd you say they're able to paint it out so you can't see it it's all just visual yeah totally, effects. Totally. <laughs> yeah but I was really, I, I consider myself very fortunate in that I recorded all my stuff because um, we, we shot out of sequence. And so we did episodes one and three at the same time. Cool. And then I think I, I went away for like a month and they shot another one. And then I came back and we did the last episode. And then they finished up the season for several months after that. Mm -hmm. But I got to do all of my work before the show had ever been announced. Ooh. And I'm so grateful for that because... It was still just like, like I knew there were incredible people involved, like John Favreau's brilliant and yep. George Lucas was there, like one of my first days on set. Whew. But it was still like, there was still so little, there was still so much that was uncertain about it that I wasn't, I wasn't really nervous. It wasn't like this huge thing that um, I didn't know what a big deal it would be. And I'm, <laughs> I'm just right. really grateful <laughs> for that. Because then, then like when the announcement came out and I was one of the random like handful of actors who was attached to it. Mm -hmm. And there was all this speculation about like, you know, who was going to be what different characters from the star Wars universe. Like I just got to sit back and watch it all unfold. And of course I wasn't allowed to say anything. So right. that was easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're able to like be at a distance from it. You're like, I don't know. I haven't seen it. That, that had to have been fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're not like in the midst of it. You're not having people follow your car, wondering where the set is. Like, no, nope. I don't know. No, see, that is my name. I mean, I we did have to. It was kind of crazy on set because anytime we were going to be walking outside the sound stage, mm -hmm. we had to put on these big black cloaks that I, oh, I, I said they were our cloaks of invisibility. Yeah. Um, because there had already been some paparazzi who'd been like outside the the studio lot like they were on standing on the roofs of like parking garages or hotels or something oh. and someone had like captured a shot of some stormtroopers and like there were a few things that had leaked so they were very very careful with keeping things secret um 
and uh, and I'm so glad that they were able to because it's just so much more fun when things are a surprise. I'm so yeah. glad that nobody figured out Baby Yoda until the show actually premiered. She for real. That's that to this day I think is one of the best kept secrets in all of entertainment history, because how? Oh my gosh! Yeah. How, how did that not even a rumor pop up beforehand? Yeah. Crazy. Crazy. Though I guess drones and snipers will keep it on lock and key pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, the trick. I, I, it's, I love that you brought up the, the idea of you doing a British accent because that was one of the first things I thought of when I found out it was you doing the voice. I was like, this never mm. happens, guys. You don't understand. <laughs> like, like Andrew Lincoln, nobody knew he was British for like years. And then come to find out, you're like, all the British people are so good that they come over and you're like, that's a really, really good accent. It almost never goes the other way. So when I found out yeah. when I found out that you weren't British, I was like, "What? Wow." Well, and that's sort of, I mean, even that is I I can thank my graduate school training because I had to do Shaw plays and like I had to I had to figure out how to do a British dialect and Ooh. you know, there's various things that I've had to learn different dialects and stuff, but that one I have had the opportunity to use so much that it's one of the easier ones for me. Sure, sure. Was the costume hot? It wasn't so bad. No. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, I I didn't, I wasn't tempted to like go out to the beach in it or anything. <laughs> but um, sure. It was not bad. It was it was very, uh, the leather was very supple, and um, it's a good word. it got a little stuffy, um, especially because like all of my stuff was was just in my my little armorer layer and sometimes it would get dusty in there and it was definitely <laughs> challenging to see because it was already dimly lit and then I'm wearing basically sunglasses so right that was fun trying to walk around without running into things or running into other people uh, which did happen I keep <laughs> I just keep like I'm I'm so so wanting them to release like a bloopers reel right because there was just so much ridiculousness that happened like when you get a bunch of mandalorians in a room together they're gonna run into each other they're gonna bonk helmets <laughs> it was ridiculous i hope to god there is a super cut of just boom, sorry sorry boom, boom, boom. oh no uh, uh sorry, i'm sorry yeah <laughs> man it would be brilliant that's so funny i so i have a friend named tori who is a massive fan of the armorer and she actually like started uh, taking blacksmithing this past year. So, oh wow! Yeah. So when like a badass you know leader of Mandalorian shows up and she's a space blacksmith, it it hits the right notes, I think. Um, but yeah. she she wanted to make sure that I asked if there was anything that you did to prepare for the blacksmithing scenes, or there any kind of research you did. And I want to add. Could you see anything you were hitting? <laughs> <'Cause>, you <know. laughs> there was. I mean, it was sort of a crash course um, because there was so little that they revealed to me before I got there. Sure. Um, but there was such a great support team. And um, and the, the guy who did our all of the props, like he himself is very skilled as a, a forger. And, um, and I feel like I remember that they brought they had a consultant that came in for the days where I was actually having to like hammer and, and forge things. And, oh, cool! and so that was helpful, but it was also, you know, I was, I wish that I had, had had more time to do it in advance because I was sort of learning it on the spot. And it's the kind of thing that, um, especially when you're wearing, <laughs> when you're wearing, uh, really bulky gloves and you can't see very well and you're holding sure. these, you know, there's certain things that I'm hammering and, and we're having to, it's like all these time cuts. So it doesn't happen in real time. So, right. um, I was, however, put at ease when John, um, cause even though John Favreau didn't like direct any of the episodes on his own, he was there for so much of it and Makes was such sense. a great resource and a guiding, guiding force. And he said that a lot of my sequences where I was forging were going to, were, he was sort of using some of the things he'd used in Iron Man. And so just knowing, like thinking about how cool that looked, I was like, okay, this is going to be fine. Like even if 
even if I'm a little clumsy with some of it, like they're going to make it look amazing. Yeah. They but it was, I mean, one of my favorite things about being an actor is that I get to learn about professions that I would never normally know anything about. And I get to try on all these things. So it was, it was fun for the little amount of time that I, I did get to sort of learn about blacksmithing um, to do yeah. that. Right on. That's yeah. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> it's that, that is kind of cool though. And you get consultant and John Favreau. I mean, come on. Come on. You got to be the Star Wars Holy equivalent cow. of Iron Man. Look at this. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. And then I know most recently you got to work on Last of Us 2, which crazy, crazy. Did you do mocap yeah. for that? Or like uh, what extent mm-hmm. were you involved in that? So how, whoa, dude. So then how was that? Did you get to wear the pajamas? Oh, yeah. Oh, sweet. Yeah, the crazy pajamas with the Velcro balls all over them. Yeah. Um, it. I mean, mocap is like, I, I feel like it's the thing that I do as an actor that is most similar to just being like a six-year-old in the backyard. Oh, cool. Um, you know, imagining some secret universe because that's what it is. Like you, you don't have any of this. You're lucky if you have like some... Um, some semblance of a structure that resembles the set that will eventually be animated in there right. because it has to be so sparse so that they can capture the people, you know, the motion capture. Right. Um, and everyone around you looks ridiculous and you know, yep. and yep. they're doing um, performance capture of your face. So it is important that you like try to experience feelings and emotions and all that. And, and you're just really having to rely on your imagination. Yeah. But it was so, it was so much fun and it was, I felt like I've done various video game work here and there, but getting involved with this and getting to talk with Neil, the creator yeah. before I ever um, got to set about like, I mean, the, the amount of, first of all, I, I had no experience with the last of us part one. I didn't know the phenomenon right. that it was until I got cast in this and I was like, Oh, maybe I should check it out. And then getting to talk <laughs> to Neil about the amount of, research and like the thoughtfulness that went into it and basically like making a film except that it's a video game for sure um it was very very cool to have that much in my head as i was going into it and then actually doing the motion capture work like you just kind of have to you have to have a great deal of humility because you look ridiculous (laughs) and you feel ridiculous yep yep and you just go for it there you go the 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 playing field is leveled when you're all wearing velcro balls definitely (laughs) oh yeah I think it also requires a certain caliber of actor to operate truthfully in character with all of that because it, there's nothing. It's all imagination. But also you can't, with your yeah. face being captured, you can't cut any corners because it's catching every eyelid totally. movement. It sounds hard. Yeah. But also fun. Yeah. It's an interesting challenge. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you you know, looking back on all these things, you've done a lot of stuff. And like different things. I've been well. so lucky to get to do. Yeah, I, I just, it's I, I'm so grateful that I've gotten to do such a weird variety of things and things that you know, some things I didn't even know I wanted to do. Like, first time I went in for a video game, I was like, no, why not? That could be fun. Yeah. And uh, you know, getting to try different things like motion capture and and uh, yeah, I, I, I love the variety of things that I've gotten to, to play in. And it's uh, from this side of the screen. It's no surprise that you've been able to do all the things because you're fantastic. On on that, thank though, you. Do you have any advice then for anyone that's trying to also pursue this type of career? Oh man, yeah. um, drink water. I mean, well, it's always a hard question to answer because, like, there's no one there's thing. No, <laughs> no, there's a million, and and it, everyone's different. But yeah. I I do think that it's important to. I think it's important to really hold on to like what you love about it because it's easy for that to get lost. Ooh, good one. Um, Because it is like, you know, the, 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 the job of acting is one thing. The job of auditioning is almost a whole different thing. Yeah. And um, it can be really easy to get discouraged. And, uh, and I think so holding on to like what it is that you love about it and um what it is that you want to do because there are so many different things you could do. And, and I'm grateful for the variety that I've gotten to do. But even within that, I recognize now that I've been doing it for a while and like, okay, my, 
my creative resources and energy do have a limit. It's not like I can sure. like put all of my energy into every single audition that comes my way. So what is it that I'm interested in working on? And what do I want to be able to throw myself into completely? I think that's important or you can get kind of burnt out just trying to go for all these random things. Um, sure. And I uh, definitely like giving a lot to your life outside of your work, I think is the only way to stay sane. And it's the best way to like have things to bring into your work. Cause it can also just get very, I mean, I love what I do. And sometimes I kind of just want to like dive into my work and ignore everything else. Um, but that's, that's very limiting because it's not actual life. <laughs> so, Agreed. Agreed. Sometimes a... it feels like we, there's, there's, it can feel like you constantly need to be working on stuff, um, working on auditions and, and um, it's not, it doesn't always have to be urgent. I think I feel like being able to trust that if you step back from it, if you put energy into other things that you will um, kind of learn what you need to learn from the other things that you're doing and that it all works together. I think having that trust is important so that you don't just constantly feel like you're needing to be frantic, like scrambling for stuff. Yeah. And like if you're performing, you need to pull it out of you. And if there's nothing there, what are you, what are you doing? Like go live life. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. I think that, and you so, said you didn't know how to answer the question, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great answer. And can you believe we've been talking for over an hour already? Look at us. Goodness gracious. We did it's it. It's been so fun. This was really fun. I had a great time. This is way cool. Me uh, too. Before I let you go, though, um, I have to ask, where can people find you online to mirror my sentiments that you're fantastic? Um, well, my Instagram and my Twitter are both Biggie Swalls. The greatest uh, which handle is... ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, though, when people don't really understand what it is, and sure. they're like, big ass walls? Yeah. What's walls? <laughs> oh. You're like, Come um, on, guys. So that's B I G E S W A L L Z. And then busy. I do have a Facebook fan page. And I try to keep up with those things to let people know what I'm doing and post about things I'm excited about. Sure. And I, I also really try to like write people back when they write. I'm not always successful at keeping up with it, but it's okay. Um, I like getting to engage with people. So, and especially with the Mandalorian and with all of the cool like cosplay and fan art stuff like yeah. whenever people tag me in that I try to repost it because I'm just amazed at the the uh, the level of talent that's out there and the things right. people make when they're inspired by Star Wars and Supernatural and all that stuff. Yeah that's when you know you're doing something right as far as your character goes when people are like I need to create this as well. Inspires everybody. Oh so much fun. That's so good. I love it. Thank you so much. And... Thank you. Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at brianbalance.com. That's balance with two L's. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps. Let them know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to get you some sweet gear. Also, I made a Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show and get access to other exclusive shows about a bunch of random things, you can now do that at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, Daryl, Logan, Victor, JC, and Christina. Your support means so much to me, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.